Let's start with the course. So welcome everyone to this, uh, actually the third edition of this advanced proteomics course for molecular biologists and clinicians. I hope you had a uh, nice trip to Barcelona for those who came from abroad. And well, and so there are still some people missing, but we start anyway, okay? So this is, um, well, as I said, the, the advanced proteomics course for molecular biologists and clinicians, which is being done within the framework of courses at CRG, and it's organized by the proteomics unit of Center of Genomic Regulation and University Pompeu Fabra. And as any other course, so this is not uh, a one-person effort, but actually a group-person effort, right? And so during the last months, we have been compiling several materials, slides, we have been doing several tutorials in the unit so that we compile uh, what we think it's an intense course. So this will be an intense week, but actually also we hope that it's a very exciting week, right? And that we can review several topics in the proteomics field. And the people that have been involved here are the following. So from the unit, it's Eva and Christina. So Eva is here. And she will be mainly involved in the theoretical sessions. Then there is also Guadalupe and Yvonne that prepared uh, most of the tutorials and you will enjoy them during the, the afternoons of this week. So to reinforce every topic that we introduce in the theoretical sessions. And then we also have four international speakers that are Marti Bernardo, oops, Marti Bernardo from EBI in UK. Christian Kaufstrom from Copenhagen, Martin Soste for, from ETH Zurich, and Bruno Domon from the Proteomics Center in Luxembourg. So all the topics that you have been highlighting are actually important for, for the proteomics analysis from the acquisition of data and data analysis, and this is what we will try to review during this course. So the goals that we, we want to achieve, right, and we would like you to, to have at the end of this course, right, so is that you have proficiency on the principles of mass spectrometry, so you understand the technique, the basics of the technique, what is it, how, how it works, a mass spectrometer. Then we will also dedicate time to discovery proteomics for quantitation, for example, to identify proteins and quantify them, also to uh, explore post-translational modifications like ubiquitinylations and phosphorylations. Then we will also dedicate some time to targeted proteomics, so how to, to actually analyze our targets of interest. Then another important thing is how to analyze our data and how to plan our experiments. And we will dedicate also some time on this. And then the last goal of the course also is to introduce you to a network analysis approach on how to get um, most information out of your data, right? Having this, this global view of the proteome, right? And not analyzing proteins by themselves one, one at a time. Right? And we have organized this by days, so every day has a topic. For example, the topic of today will be principles of mass spectrometry, and we will review so which are the types of instruments and mass analyzers that exist, which are the main workflows in proteomics, and how to actually visualize and interpret the spectra. Right? So the, the spectra is the data that we get from, from the mass spec, so how to interpret them manually, and then we will build on this to how to do it automatically. And then also some, some information about sample preparation. Every day there are tutorials, right? So this is the theoretical part, and then we have prepared several tutorials to reinforce and practice all the theoretical topics that we will introduce during the mornings. So Tuesday we will dedicate it completely to discovery proteomics. We will do the automatic database search. We will deal with post-translational modifications. And we will also review everything related to quantitative proteomics. So how we quantify our proteins of interest and which techniques and which challenge are in the proteomics field to do quantitative proteomics. And again, so we have a tutorial, which is the automatic spectra interpretation using a free software like MaxQuan. So Wednesday. The topic will be targeted proteomics, so we will dedicate the whole Wednesday to only targeted proteomics, so, and Eva will introduce what is actually targeted proteomics, in which uh, type of experiments we should use, or it's recommended to, to use targeted proteomics, which are the concepts of one of the techniques of targeted proteomics, which is SRM, that 
probably some of you already know, and which is the workflow. So how we choose our proteins, and from the proteins, how we choose the peptides that we want to monitor, and from there, how we acquire the data and how we analyze this data. And we will put everything in practice in the tutorial. Right? So, and here it's a, a tutorial on how to analyze targeted proteomics data. Also important, so Wednesday we will have a social activity, we will have a visit in the old town of Barcelona, and also following this visit we will have a course dinner. Okay, so, and this is, so I think you've received all the information by email with a map, but we will leave from here so um, we can go together to, to, to the social activity. And then on Thursday we will dedicate it to statistics proteomics, so we will review which methods of statistics we apply, normally in, in the proteomics workflow, how to do pro downstream analysis, and then also, um, in this case, um, Yvonne and, and Guadalupe have prepared the proteomics data analysis using, again, uh, a free software like Perseus. And, and finally, on Friday, we will do the introduction to network analysis of proteomics data. So this is a whole field of, of, of research even, right? And, and here we will have some flavor on how to start using these techniques to actually interpret your data. Here we will dedicate all the morning to both the introduction and the tutorial, and we will dedicate the afternoon to student presentation. So you were assigned already some duties of preparing two or three slides of your current project, and what we would like you to do on Friday is actually present your project, but not only this, but actually implement what you have learned to the, in the course and say, well, this is my project, this is how I wanted to do it, but now, having, having learned this and that, I would do it like this, right? And not only this, but I also expect you to, to comment on others' projects, right? So if someone is presenting something and you think that it might be better to do it in another way, so then speak up and, and we will have some discussions. It's important also to tighten it to five, ten minutes maximum because we are a lot of people and, and we have limited amount of time Friday afternoon. So and here is the overview of, of the course. So just to comment that in general, we will have all the mornings, so the, these three first hours, theoretical sessions with a coffee break in between. Then just before lunch, we have always every day the, the seminar from the invited speaker, except for today that we will, what we will do is a visit to the unit, right, and to see in life the, the, both the HPLCs and the, and the different type of mass spectrometers that we have. And then we dedicate all the afternoons to practical sessions. So, any questions so far? No? From the administrative point of view, everything is clear. So, you also have your materials, right? So, we, uh, in the back, with uh, so all the slides and tutorials that you will be seeing during these days, and, and uh, also the instruction on how to reach the social activity, okay? In case you want to go in your own. So, and now, with the rest of the the time that we have for this first session, what I wanted to do is review a little bit the status of the proteomics field for each of the topics that we will be doing during this week. And the first one is discovery proteomics. And here I would like to highlight two, two papers that have been published during the last year, which are called A Draft Map of the Human Proteome from Ale Alexei Pandey, Achilles Pandey, and mass spectrometry-based draft of the human proteome from Bernard Kuster. So these were both published in Nature during 2014. They have been, uh, they have been a high highlight in the proteomics field because they set a status of, in the field saying, well, now we are able to quantify and identify all proteins in all type of tissues in the human sample. And the impact of these papers has been similar to the ENCODE project or GTX uh, project in the genomics field. So showing that the field is mature enough to actually have this type of knowledge and from here built on in different applications. So in the first, in the first paper, which is this draft of the human proteome from Achilles Pandey, what they did is they took adult tissues from very different parts of the human body, also from embryons, so different fetal tissues, and not only this, but also hematopoietic cells from different types. Right? And for each of them, they extracted the proteins, they fractionate this, 
and each of the fractions they analyzed by mass spectrometry. And as you can imagine, this is not just one sample or, or dozens of samples, not even hundreds, but these are thousands of samples being analyzed in a mass spectrometer. Right? And then what they said is, well, now we are able to identify which proteins are present in each of these tissues. And not only this, but we have an estimate on how abundant is each protein in each of these tissues. Right? And what they had is for each of these tissues here, so here is the, all the proteins, so uh, expression patterns. And therefore, what they can say is, well, we have some patterns and proteins that are, that are typical or, 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 yes, typical from certain, certain tissues, right? So for example, B cells, so these proteins, so these are kind of signatures of proteins that are specific of these cells and shows the quality also of the data. Not only this, but this group, what they did is also they explored the isoforms, right? So for example, for this gene here that have three isoforms, what they, they found in the data is that actually isoform one is more present or more abundant in fetal, in fetal and adult tissues, whether isoform two is dominating in hematopoietic cells. And this is just one example, but these data sets actually offer this information, not for only for this protein, but for most of the proteins of, of the of the human proteome, right? And so these are a complete, quite complete set. And similarly, but in this case, with different protein or isoforms or, or proteins that are forming a protein complex, right? So here is the proteasome, and the proteasome has different units. And what they found here is that actually these units can be different. And this, and which are the units participating in the proteasome depends on the tissue that, that you are analyzing. And what they found is that for each of these tissues, they know how many of these subunits are present in the proteasome complex. And for example, so here you can see that in certain tissues, the proteasome is dominated by these gray and red subunits, whether in other tissues, there are the red one is substituted by, by the green one. Right? And again, so this is just an example for the proteasome, but this kind of data is available for all or many or most of the, the protein complexes in, in the cell. And finally, in this same paper, what they found are new open reading frames. So for example, so these are genes that were not predicted to, to be coding. And actually here, what they found is the, the, the gene product. So the peptide or the protein corresponding to, to this sequence. And then they go back to the, to the original DNA sequence and actually they found an ETG here and starting colon, and they can say, well, this was annotated as a non-coding region, but actually we now have the evidence at the protein level that this, this sequence is coding for, for a certain protein. And similarly for non-coding RNAs, which are these RNAs that are not supposed to be coding a protein, and this is why they are coding, called non-coding RNAs, but what they find is several evidences, several peptides that say, well, this is actually translated. And this is not anymore a non-coding RNA formally, but actually this RNA is encoding a protein that is being translated. And again, so this is one example for this particular case, but we can, or they can actually extend this knowledge to many other non-coding RNAs that they have been identified in, in the data set. The second paper, which is called mass spectrometry based draft of the human protein from Bernard Kuster. It's similar, but what they did is they took not only different tissues and body fluids and, for example, 150 different cell lines and affinity purifications, but they also took, take, took the, all the data in public repositories. So this is, as you can see, more than 6,000 samples analyzed in the mass spectrometry plus 10,000 samples that have been analyzed by other groups in the world, and everything together in a supercomputer, they can actually reanalyze all this data with MassCode and MaxQuan, and they have all the results that they have built or put into a database that is called Proteomics DB. So what they found is a huge uh, coverage of all the human proteome. This has triggered some discussions in the field whether there are some positive, some false positives or not, but in in any way, what they, they show is that actually for most of the, or 
all the, all the chromosomes, including the mitochondrial chromosome, they have over 90% and in most cases over 95% of the proteins encoded for each chromosome identified in any of the samples, right? So, of course, it's not that all the proteins in chromosome 1 are expressed and being identified in just one tissue, but in overall, in all the tissues, so they are able to actually map all the proteins in code or most of the proteins in code for chromosome 1 and so on and so forth. And what they have, again, so it's not only which proteins are expressed or present in one tissue or another, but they can also have, so this is abundance of some pro example proteins here, and so they have not only the identification, but also an estimation of the quantity of all these proteins in each of the, in each of the, the tissues. And then, they, again, so similar to what we have seen before, so what they can do is these, these heat maps of expression of proteins in different tissues, and then they can see patterns of proteins that are characteristic of one tissue or another. And they zoom out, they zoom in, and these are this is the same heat map, but just for kinases, right? So kinases, as you know, regulate all the uh, intercellular phosphorylation system. And what they ask here is, are all kinases expressed in all tissues? And the answer, as you can see here, is no. And not only this, but they are in different, uh, in different abundances depending on the tissue. And for example, in spleens, so here there is a bunch of, a bunch of kinases that are quite specific of these, maybe some of them shared with the lung, but these kinases are not present in any other tissue. And this might be very important to, to explain why spleen is behaving in a different way than many other tissues in the, in the, in the human body. Right? So overall, what they show is identification and quantitation of proteins in all these different tissues in the human body. Right? So any questions for, for these first papers? No? Any curiosity? How did they quantify? So they quantified, they did an estimation of, of, of the abundance of proteins. For example, in, in this case, I think they show a, a method that it's called IVAC, right? And this is uh, an estimation of, pro, of protein quantity based on the, the abundance of the, each of the peptides present for that particular protein. Right? So, but we will have also, uh, in the session of quantitation, we will review all these concepts. Okay, so another thing, so we have seen how proteomics can actually describe the healthy, disease, the healthy state, right? So we have been talking about tissues of human samples in, in, in the health state, but actually proteomics has also advanced a lot on characterizing disease states, right? And this is another Nature paper from 2014 published by the consor American consortium called CPTAC that they, what they want to do or the goal is to actually characterize tissues from, for example, in this case, colorectal cancer, but also breast cancer and ovarian cancer and do similar approaches as we have seen before. So which are the proteins that are characteristic in, in this type of samples and whether all samples from, from, in this case, human colorectal cancer are similar or you can see differences depending on the patients. And what they have seen, again, is that actually when they do the identification and this estimation of protein abundances in, in different th or thousands of, of samples from colorectal cancer is that actually they have patterns and they can stratify different types of different types of, of tumors, right? And they can say that this patient is, is much different from this other one, but actually this third patient is very close to the first one. And they have correlated this with known mutations because this consortium also has been sequencing all this data or, or all these samples, and also they can correlate this to response to treatment, right? And this is one of the highlights or the hallmarks of, of proteomics during also this, this last year. The same Consortium, it's also involved in many, in many activities on targeted proteomics. And what they do is not only they characterize this, all these samples, but actually they identify which are the proteins that are involved in cancer. And then the goal is to do targeted assays so that anyone in the world can actually take this assay 
as if it was an antibody and measure this particular protein in any, any, in any sample. And within this goal, so they have been publishing two papers that are highlighted here in Nature Bi Biotechnology. And with this goal, what they pretend is not only to do these assays, or because actually doing an assay, as we will see on Wednesday, it's pretty, pretty straightforward, but actually do quantitative assays. So this means that they are reliable, they are consistent, they are robust, and that if I do the assay in this lab, and then someone from another lab is actually using this assay, we can actually be reproducible. And what they have seen is they have taken the peptides for each of these proteins of interest. They have been doing dilution curves to see the limit of detection, limit of quantitation. And not only this, but actually you can see that this is site 19, site 52, so on and so forth, until almost 100 sites. So these are over 100 laboratories that have tested exactly the same uh, targeted assay so that they can see which is the interlaboratory coefficient of variation and how robust and how uh, good are these, these assays for quantitative purposes. So at the end, for each of these proteins, what they have, this is not very important, but actually what it's this column, for example, the interlaboratory CV. So each row is a different, is a different <coughs> assay, and actually they have been quantifying this, this CV and which is the margin or the interval of confidence of this variability. Right? And now what we know is that these, these are actually very good targeted assays that one can use anywhere in the world to, to quantify and identify proteins of interest. The nice thing is that they did also a web repository where you can actually browse for your favorite proteins. And then, so it's, I think it's, maybe it's not very visible here, but here it's a protein, different peptides. So these are two assays for this given protein. And then here are all the data that you need to actually target your, your or, or this protein in your system. Okay? And they annotate these assays in a way that you have all the information to do your own experiment, but also you have all the information to know how reliable is this particular assay and which is the quality of the data that you will get after, after measuring these samples. Questions? No? So then we move to the next, the next topic, right? So we will do today, I didn't introduce it yet, the principles of mass spectrometry. We have seen discovery proteomics, target proteomics, and on Thursday, what we will see is statistics in proteomics. And here, there has been also quite a lot of discussion during the last year. And one of the highlights that was published in, also in Nature as a brief note is that a, a psychology journal bans p-value, right? So this means that in this journal, p-values will not be accepted anymore, right? And the thing is, and Nature comments, so there is a comment on Nature on, uh, regarding this ban p-value, which actually was also a trending topic in Twitter, <laughs> is that we believe that p-value 0.05 or 0.01 is, is too easy to pass and sometimes serves an excuse for lower quality research. And the thing is that a lot of people or in a lot of journals, we are very strict on seeing whether this p-value is significant or not. And actually, right, p-values are just the tip of the iceberg, right, of all the process. This is the last parameter that we get after having done the experimental design, having acquired the raw data, having normalized our raw data, having applied several statistical models, having a summary of a statistical summary, and then calculating the p-value. And here there is extreme scrutiny on whether this p-value is significant or not. But in many journals, there is no discussion about any of these steps. And actually, modifying any of these steps, for example, normalization, actually can change dramatically your p-value. And on Thursday, what we want to do is to actually review and put emphasis on each of these states so that actually you know how to design your experimental design, how to normalize your raw data, or at least know in which cases or which assumptions we are doing when we are normalizing uh, data in one way or in another, how to remove um, outliers, and which are the mod statistical models that are more appropriate for different types of proteomic experiments. And finally, at the end of the day, we will review the p-value. Okay? So this for Thursday. And then last topic is network analysis. 
right? And as you know, proteins are not isolated in the cell, but actually they are in contact or interacting with each other. And these interactions can be physical interactions. So the proteins actually build together to form protein complexes that have a certain function or in the cell, or they can also build up in a way that this interaction is a functional interaction. So one protein activates the other or inhibits the other, for example, through a phosphorylation, acetylation, or wicketinylation, right? And with proteomics, we are, we are very good with this technique to actually do two things. The first one is to identify the proteins that are forming this network and also the, the edges. So for example, whether these are, this phosphorylates this one or whether this interacts with these ones with affinity purification uh, strategies. But also we can actually quantify this and see how these interactions, either physical or functional, change in time and space. So for example, in a time course or in a treatment with a drug or whatever. Okay? This gives us a broad view or overview on the proteomics data that actually can help us understanding and dealing with disease-related pro protein changes. For example, this is a case in which we analyzed a protein sample and we have identified all these proteins. We build them in a way, so we visualize them in a way that we not only put the proteins and the fold changes, but also which protein interacts with which. And we can see that of all these proteins that we have identified and quantified, there are three of them that I put here in, in black that are increased in abundance in the disease state. Right? And then with this data, I could say, well, let's do some follow-up on, on these three candidates right? and see whether they are biomarkers or whether they are drug targets or whatever. Right? Doing a network analysis, what allows me is to say, well, let's stop here and let's explore which other proteins that I did not identify in my experiment are interacting or have some functional relationship with my three proteins, right? And I add what is called the first networks, and we will explore this more on Friday. And then what I realize is that there is a fourth protein that actually is interacting with my three candidates. And if this is a ubiquitinase uh, enzyme, uh, E3, or kinase enzyme, or a transcription factor that regulates actually the, the, the abundance of these three proteins, probably the protein that I want to to do the follow-up, it's neither this one, not, nor this one, nor this one, but this one here, right? And this would be, in this case, my favorite drug target or my favorite biomarker candidate to, to understand how the disease is, is, is working. And this is how network analysis of proteomics data, integrating things that we have not identified and we have not uh, quantified with mass spectrometry can actually really help us on understanding and better uh, getting information from our proteomic results. And this is actually what we did in one of our latest papers in which we use these network-based proteomic approaches to actually see what happens after axonal damage. And here, what we, can, what we know is that when there is axonal damage, there are two ways in which the cells can react. One way is the um, neurodegeneration, and the other one is the repair. Right? So um, that cells repair this damage. Okay? And we were lucky to have a model, a control model, a control for degeneration, and a control for, for regeneration. And what we did is we identified several subnetworks, so groups of proteins that actually um, work together in these two processes, so the regenerative process and the degenerative process. And this we to do this, we mined the literature so that we have several um, nodes or subnetworks right, that are involved in here. And we ask, well, when we do a proteomic experiment in this or characterization of this type of models or samples after axonal damage, what happens with each of these networks? Right? So we, we, we were able to build these subnetworks. And then, so here is like the summary thing. So in the regenerative process, or the degenerative process, we actually ask which are the networks that are up or down regulated on average, not single proteins, but as a whole in, in each of these processes. And then we also compare which are the main differences between not only between regeneration and the control or degeneration and the control, but between regeneration and degeneration. And this gives us 
much much more data that if we or information that if we would go have gone one by one analyzing or trying to understand what is this protein involved in in this process similarly this is another paper also published during last year and deals with protein pr mutations and how mutations um, interrupt or distort protein protein interactions right so here for example, this is the common variant in green, and this protein is interacting with these five, or this, yes, these five other proteins. In some cases, this protein, in, in particular individuals, is mutated, but this mutation that is introduced here does not change the landscape, so the network interactions of this network. And therefore, the biological relevance in the disease state of these mutations is almost zero or this is what it has been seen, right? So that there is a mutation in one particular loop, but actually this, this mutation is not changing the partners of interaction. In, con in the contrary, so for the same protein, there are some mutations that actually really alter the, the partners of interaction. And for example, in this case, so out of the five, only there is one that remains. And here, there has a big impact on, on the biology. And you can see, he, this is one of the many experiments that they did in this, in, this, in this case where you can see that so given protein, right, 5-1-D, so it's interacting with all these. They introduce a point mutation in, in one arginine that does not change the, the network of interactors and the phenotype that is seen is unaffected. Okay? In the contrary, when they change uh, for another mutation that actually changes the interactors, actually this leads to breast cancer. Right? And this is a field in proteomics that is now exploited to see how different mutations or, or polymorphins like SNPs or even post-translational modifications are changing the interactome of certain proteins and how this can lead to disease states. And actually, so this is a paper from, from Patrick Alloy in which Ruggiero Olivella, that is now, well, it's sitting uh, in the back of the room and it's part now of our proteomics unit, but he worked before in, in Patrick Alloy lab. So they, they built a, a database in which they map or they collect all these mutations that actually change partners, right? So for example, in this database, you can put your, your favorite protein and then ask which are the, pro the known mutations for this particular protein and which of these mutations are changing the interactome of this protein. Right? And then, for example, for this particular case, so this is just an example, right? So this is the interactome, but actually here you can see that, or, or barely see, that there is a mutation that actually, or that this interaction here, which was the same here, it's depending on one particular mutation. Whereas this other here also depends on another particular mutation, right? And you can go to this database for your favorite protein and ask which mutations do alter the interactome of my, of my favorite protein. And with this, right, so I, I wanted to, to, to review the five or, well, so these are the main five goals of, of, the, of the course. We have reviewed discovery proteomics, targeted proteomics, statistical proteomics, network analysis, and now in the next session, we'll start with principles of mass spectrometry. So, questions? Thank you.